G'day. Here at The Regenerative Journey, part of our goal is to educate our followers on the benefits of knowing where their food comes from and the knock-on effects this can have on our health, our environment and our future generations. Understanding the connection has never been more important and in the spirit of this endeavour, we have teamed up with Highland Beef Pastoral Company, a grass-fed beef supply chain servicing the growing US grass-fed consumer market, who I'm excited to announce are our Season 6 show sponsors. Essentially, this Australian-based business places cattle on their member graziers' properties at no expense to the farmer and provides competitive returns for every kilo of beef produced, allowing their graziers to focus on improving their businesses in a capital-free and risk-free environment. Highland Beef Graziers are some of the best grass and animal managers in the country. Livestock are humanely and lovingly cared for while on their farms and customers are guaranteed a very high-quality, regeneratively managed grass-fed and finished product with full transparency from farm to plate. If you're interested in finding out more about this program, visit highlandbeef.com forward slash Charlie Arnott. About 70% of the farms that came into the program initially, you know, they might not have described their business practices as regenerative, but when we went around and had a look at them, we noticed that they were pretty well the same. We've got one who was one of the first guys I spoke to it about it, and he simply said to me, I farm naturally, which I've always really held on to that because I sort of look at a lot of the things that are happening in our supply chain and I just say, okay, well, if it aligns with what would happen naturally in this environment, then, you know, that's going to be a good way of marketing things. And secondly, I think it's actually a much more dependable business model to follow. That was Murray Richardson and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. From wherever we are, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, recognising their continuing connection to this land, its waterways, the stars in the skies since time immemorial. We pay our respects to the elders, knowledge holders and to all the generations of First Nations peoples who have nurtured their unceded sovereign lands for over 80,000 years and continue to do so today. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an eighth generational Australian regenerative farmer. And in this podcast series, I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host, Charlie Arnott. G'day. Welcome back to season six of The Regenerative Journey. I have, I have to say, enjoyed my time away from um, not so much the microphone because I was pretty busy during the, the, the downtime between season five and six, uh, but the um, just a bit of, yeah, downtime. It's at, it was over winter. Winter is traditionally the time of the year when one, one and one's family, um, but certainly in the farming context, I like to think you could slow down a bit, not so much hibernate, but it's sort of the time on the earth breathing in. There's a lot of activity internally um, in the under, you know, in the earth, and and uh, reflecting that um, could be it's a good idea to be uh, sort of internally, ref, you know, sort of um, recharging, reflecting, uh, making plans for spring when the that just goes bananas. Um, it's been for us. It's been really wet, actually. Um, very wet, wet winter. Uh, we, I think, Brock told me today that, and we're in. I'm doing this. It's sort of the end of September. We've already hit our annual um, annual rainfall, and we've got three months to go. <clears throat> we got. We actually hit a thousand mils last 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 calendar year, um, and given the time of year, and um, I reckon we're going to probably we're going to hit that. Nearly again. Um, it came with the challenges last year. Well, last, um, yeah, last financial year, last, last, um, I guess we, we sort of go on in the financial year, 12 months sort of as our time frames we work on. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, yeah, sheep sooked it. I might have mentioned it in the, actually, um, at the end of the last, last season. So I won't bang on too much about that as to, to not complaining at all. Never complain about the rain. Uh, it's just, it's come with its challenges, which we are adapting to. 
and working on because you know maybe the the wetter years are going to be wetter and the dry years are going to be dry I and mean, we have to have to um keep tabs on uh excuse me what works and what doesn't work in such a wet year now i have a cat roaming around here somewhere blue and she was sitting up here a minute ago very noisy sounding like a tractor she's that loud um, so, look, welcome back, everyone. Uh, really pleased to be back for season six. Um, we are very, you know, very um, grateful to be sponsored by Holland Beef Pastoral Company this season. Um, Murray is actually the, um, uh, he's my guest in this episode, um, number two for, se- for the season six. Um, before I bang on about Murray, I would just was thinking about, you know, the Roma ran out my ass. what I was going to talk about this time. It's actually, I think, what's what's been um, uh, not evident, but certainly something that's been on my mind or sort of been topical in the last few months is, and it's a word that came up in, I'd never seen it before, Sherry Gooding told me about it in, oh, well, she had a poster on it at her house when I went to interview her back in June, an icky guy. Um, you, some of those, you might have seen the sort of the, um, the diagram, I'll use it in a PowerPoint occasionally, four circles in it, and um, it's basically sort of the cross-section of those four circles, those four circles being what you love, uh, what are you good at, um, what, can you, what can you be paid for, and what does the world need, and where those intersect um, uh, is, 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 well, I used to, <clears throat> I used to call it purpose, but uh, it's the same thing, really, ikigai is a Japanese phrase, the Japanese secret to a long and happy life. So... Um, why am I telling you this? Oh, you know, what is your reason for being? That's pretty much the the first um, the first chapter or upfront in a book that I read in the uh, um, in the break. Uh, Icky guy, the Japanese secret to a long and happy life. Hector Garcia and friends. Oh, I'm not going to get that. Frances, French. I don't even know if it's a boy or a girl. What about it's a father? I think F R R F R A N C E S C. Francis, I don't know, Morales. Anyway, I've probably absolutely butchered that name, <clears throat> but uh, he writes a good book. And, uh, yeah, I read that over the, over the break, and it just really got me thinking about uh, my purpose. Um, am I on purpose and what is my reason for being? Big questions that I guess um, given that – my age and stage of life, these things come up. Um, I think, and it's, and it's not uncommon, and I think it's a good thing um, because you know if you're asking yourself better questions like that, like uh, what is your reason? What is your reason for being? It's pretty profound. Let's hope we come up with some good answers. Um, maybe it's a question I should be asking my guests as a, as a theme through season six. It's probably a bit late to, to say that because we'll put that in there because I've basically interviewed two thirds or three quarters of my guests already, which has been great. Michelle's been cracking the whip on me and I've been doing lots of interviews between seasons. For those who are on the, I'm not sure even sure I'm going to use this um, video of the rant. I was sort of thinking about putting it on, on YouTube and things. You'll see that I'm actually shrouded by a um a portable mattress. I'm trying to sort of dull the noise a bit for Reese in the office here at Hannah Minnow. Um or one or or the Angie's office actually of who rang it for the time being. Um so look there you go. Icky guy. It's a wonderful word, wonderful thing, and just a lovely thing to be sort of considering. Plenty of other books that sort of focus on that. Um I won't even, I won't exhaust you. I won't, I won't bore you with all, all those um the names of them. But uh, you know, I guess it's Topical, you know, mindfulness, well-being. I was listening to a podcast today um, that touched on mindfulness and well-being. It wasn't to- so totally about that, but it was identifying there's so much of that in the world. You know, every second TED Talk is, is talking about it. Um, and it's not a bad thing. It's quite – it's definitely topical. I guess the thing is, you know, all the books that are written and, and read, is that being executed? You know, are people being mindful? What's that look like? What does a more mindful world look like? I don't know. It's quite um, – Dare I say chaotic? It's actually my mum said an interesting thing last night. She said, you know, that's a, you know, she say, um, Jinzo was a hor- horrible time to be alive. Um, she no, it wasn't that, but she said, oh, it's you know, um, ghastly. I think it was ghastly time to be, you know, the world was in right now. And I had to reflect and think, well, you know, yeah, it feels bad given, you know, say the where the world was five years ago or three years ago. But where the world was 500 years ago, I think um, 
actually pretty pleased I'm living in this age. Uh, at this point in time, because, um, you know, 500 years ago I could have died of cholera, could have been, I don't know, God knows what. <laughs> I don't know what would have happened to me in a previous life. But I think we're actually, if we just put things in perspective, we're probably not doing too badly. Um, before I go to Murray, there is something that um, I was listening to, to today as well, and Clive Bircham, a good buddy, um, put me onto it. And it was talking about the a, a book, and I, and I was listening to the audio book, I think, uh, um, the, the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Really good listening and book, that one. Um, it's got quite a, a Christian sort of bent on it, uh, and that's been, it was great. That was sort of the context, and it was really good. It was actually a really lovely framework to be talking about the uh, ruthless elimination of hurry, and it talked about technology and the distraction and our busyness and, you know, is that actually making us better, you know, happier people. Um, it was fascinating. So lots of that stuff going through my mind at the moment. Um Got to slow down, got to put a few balls down before I drop them um, and getting some help with that from a very solid team that I have, have here at Hanamino, I've got to say, and, and um, an associated, <laughs> associated people and team members. Enough of me. I think I want to talk about Murray Richardson, whom I met a couple of years ago through a sourdough business pathways group, a mentoring group up at Byron Bay. Um Murray was was instrumental in the creation of that, and it was a fan. It's, it is still a fantastic organisation um, that mentors businesses, and there's plenty of them up there um, in uh, at Byron Bay, and um, you know startups and and individuals who are sort of getting business you know businesses underway and tapping into the vast wealth of wisdom and mentors up there in the Byron Bay area. So met my Murray through that, and. Um, and then I uh, got to know more about Murray's um, business, Highland, um, Highland Beef. And um, I'll, he'll talk, talk to you about what it actually is and what they do. And, um, but when I sat down with him a couple of weeks ago, it was fantastic. Really, really enjoyed Murray's company. He's really, you know, really, I want to say a deep thinker, but he's, a, he's really thorough. He's a really thorough sort of thinker about things and really, really pleasant to be around. I know that that, that that might sound a bit lame, pleasant, but it really is. It's like it was an absolute delight to sit with Murray there in his home um, up in the Northern Rivers of New South Wales and um, and have a really good yarn and really looking forward to um, the association we'll, we'll have with Murray and Highland Beef um, through season six. So he's next. He's now. Um, you're done with me for the time being. The next, um, the next, uh, the next Roma will be episode three, which is going to be Brock Hatton, who I spoke with today, actually. Um, and uh, it was that was that was a good yarn too. Some associations with with um, uh, well, lots of lots of different people in my world, um, which I'll get to in the Roma for Brock. Uh, when you listen in for next week. Um, here it is, Murray Richardson. I really enjoyed the chat with, with Murray, and I hope you do too, on The Regenerative Journey, Season 6, Episode 2. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey. Good to be here. And welcome to your living room. Yeah. I believe. It's the, it's the, <laughs> the living room. That's right. We're looking out at a beautiful... Um, uh, not a jacaranda. That's a, a Ponciana. Ponciana. Big Poncianas, yeah. I always get confused. Poncieta or Ponciana? Um, I've, I've heard people say. I always say Ponciana. Ponciana, yeah. yeah. I'm in your camp there. Mm. Um, we've got, we're have got we sitting on some rickety, as in some noisy chairs, so please forgive us for that. But we are, and we are inside um, because um, it was a bit noisy out there the, with a the bit of wind and a bit of, bit of traffic. Um, but I always start my interviews, Murray, um, with a question, and we're in, we're here at your house because we could do this over Zoom, mm. but that would be half as fun. Mm. Um, we're here in, in your home, in your sort of, I, I, I trust and, and, and suspect happy place, or one of them. Um, what does it mean for you to be here? I know a little bit of history about you being here, but what does it mean to be, you know, have this as a, is it a sanctuary? Is it a special place? Yeah, look, it's we, we've been here for a long while. It's um, oh, sort of fifteen odd years. Um, it's a you know nice block of land with a good view of the ocean. You know, sit out there, have a cup of tea, watch the whales, which is 
something really special this time of year. Um, and look, it's you know it's been a nice been a nice family home. This place it's been good. You know, plenty of kids always running around, horses, and I think we you know we love the green here. It's even when it's really dry, it's green here. You know, it's and it's it's just a really nice lush sort of place. Always feels good. Yeah. And we're in the Northern Rivers. I, did, I probably should have added that. Um, Tinton Bar is, I guess, your closest rural locality. Mm. Um, that's got a little servo and a little store there, hasn't it? Is that Tinton yeah, Bar? Yeah, yeah, it just, is. Yeah, that's that's all we have, mm. my little shop. And why the Northern Rivers? Like, of all the places in the world, Murray, having read your CV and seen all your experience, why here? Um, look, I came here uh, to came here in two thousand and four to for work, yeah, in the dairy sector up here, and um, you know it's and it just we just fitted in and stayed here ever since, and it's worked pretty well for us family wise, and um, yeah, so um, well, it's like it's changed a lot in that time too, you know. I mean, sort of fifteen years ago, uh, you know, we came from Melbourne to here, and it probably felt a bit you know, a bit sort of isolated, but Brisbane's changed a lot. You've got, you know, we've got good airports. So, you know, with the highway and things, it's actually, it's a terrific place, really. Mm. Yeah, everything's here we need. There's a lot going on, isn't there? Um, and I find that the, it's a sort of a, <clears throat> an area where a lot of people come to retire or, or, or and not even when they're old, mm. they sort of like mm. do their thing elsewhere and they come here and then they get bored. It's almost like they've made their, their you know, their wealth and they come here to, Surf, yeah. They hear five minutes and they go, God, I'm bored. I need to do something else. So it's real. Um, yeah. We'll get to sourdough later on. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, um, as part of your regenerative journey. And Murray, this is not about farming regeneratively. Well, it kind of can be, depending on the guest and experience. But um, I'm interested to know your your re- somewhat regenerative. Well, not not somewhat, as in it's only a bit of regenerative story. Your your life story to this point. <laughs> um, where would you? Where do you want to start? How far back do you want to go? Where were you born? I know where you went to school. Yeah, the well, one one of them, Barrel. Yeah. yeah, I was born in Sydney, so um, born in Sydney, and uh, um, we moved when we were really young to Maroolan. Actually, we had a um, uh, sheep and beef property at Maroolan. Well, actually, had a little place called Big Hill. There's Big just, Hill? Yeah, there's just a refrigerator at Big Hill. was when we grew up there and there still is. <laughs> what do you mean refrigerator? Was it was like a roux box or something, a pig box? Oh, they used to drop a mail there. Oh. So they used to, so all the kids would get dropped there with the mail bags in the afternoon and uh, we used to go to school on the mail bus. So, yeah, that was how we got to school. And um, so uh, we, we were there for quite a while and then we moved into Barrel um, for, well, for a number of reasons that sort of went through a Bit of a tough time drought wise and stuff, and dad dad was actually a sign writer by by trade. That's actually what he was. Draw anything was fantastic, you know, with art and stuff. And um, but yeah, we moved into Barrel, and mum um, and dad were there until they sort of passed on. Yeah, so and you're a chef boy, a chef boy. Yeah, yeah, went through Chevalier College, and uh, yeah, still got a, a good group of friends out of that. Actually, mm. still got a good group of. Um, in fact, it's our yeah, I think it's our forty-year reunion this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it's not forty this year, it was last year. It's, a, it's about it's about that time of my life, Charlie. <laughs> but there's still there's uh, I don't look like that. Too. No, <laughs> you look so you much look younger, that, you? Murray. I can't believe I didn't take that bait just then. I usually do. I wasn't going to give you that one. Uh, anyway, yeah, but no, it's uh, it was good school. Yeah. <laughs> And how did what what age were you when you moved from the farm? So from a farm situation, you know, day to day, to to more more suburban um, urban kind of thing. Probably twelve, fifteen, something like that. So yeah. formative, formative years, but Dad, so, so to speak. At the, yeah, on the we farm. always, or even though we moved into Barrel, we always had a property. So Dad, had, Mum, and Dad had a property out of Kangaroo, and um, yeah, so we've always, you know, we've always had horses and animals and stuff in our life, and. Um, and sort of interestingly, you know, once I finished school and went to uni and stuff like that, went straight into food. Not, I think it was just a really sort of natural progression for me. It just, it was the only sector I actually looked at. It was really interesting. And we we won't jump too fast forward, but was food, 
you said, is was food because of the farming? Was that kind of the relationship, or was it just like, oh, food will that'll that'll that's something to do? Uh, no, I was always just I was always just um, sort of interested in the fact that you know. Um, you know, it's something you need three times a day. It's a. It wasn't really a fashionable industry then. Everyone, all of my mates from uni, were getting into law or computing and lots of different things. So food wasn't really seen as being, you know, anything special. But it just always appealed to me that it's something you need. It's one of those things that's there. And it's it's, it's interesting how sort of for how we take it for granted so much. But you know, you'll change a lot in your life. But you eat three meals a day every day. Was that a conscious? <clears throat> was that a conscious thing? Was it like, oh, what will I get into? Something? What? Is, what is something that people need, or there's a, there's kind of a demand for? Was, was that kind of the the thought process at the time? Um, I don't know. I don't know if it was so much that. I mean, I was always, you know, I'd always sort of had people around that were in agriculture, and there was always people that were doing stuff in farming that I always found intriguing. And I think it was just an extension of that. I don't know that it was a, you know, uh, it was. I don't know that there was some big, you know, guiding sort of principle that sort of headed me that way. But I just it was the space I just naturally looked at. You know, there's lots of lots of segments you can look at when you're sort of starting to look at a career and say, oh, well, what do I want to do in general business or commerce or whatever? And that was just the one that really appealed to me. So I I was really fortunate to um, get a sort of a um, uh, a a um, oh, cadetship type program uh, with Cabbage Webs actually. And it was fantastic because they just put you through a whole heap of learning around supply chains and ingredients and all those different sorts of things. And, you know, um, yeah, it was great. So right from the very bottom, in fact, my first day at work was driving a truck. Mm. Uh, yeah. Age? Uh, would have been 22, 20, oh, maybe 23, 24. Yeah. So, so as in went, went to went to work in a suit and got given a <laughs> Hey, can you drive a truck? No, I can't. Okay, well you better learn. So that was, Did you have a license? No, no, I had to I had to actually uh go and get a license and um I learned yes, yeah, so I got my truck license in a Bedford uh, in an old Bedford truck and had to come do that and then delivered stuff for 12 months. So that was kind of part of the cadetship. You're going to learn every part of this business. Yeah, started from, right, really the bottom, from the, right at the bottom. So it was like, okay, this is, this is, and it was great because there was the customer every day, you know, and, um, you know, you could, you got that direct feedback. So yeah, and then sort of, you know, gradually worked right the way back through the business into essentially selling stuff. Yeah. Is that a, um, is that important? Is that something that that you you obviously experienced in your in your cadetship, your internship? Is that something that you em, you employed that tactic of getting people to start from the bottom going forward? Was that an important sort of part of the recipe for someone's growth, career, business development? Um, look, I think well, it, I think it is really important. I mean, I think you can. I always look at. For, for for me, it's worked particularly well. I mean, you know, we our business today is a supply chain. That's actually what we run. So it's sort of interesting. I haven't come too far when you think about that. But um, I just think, you know, really getting a sense of what the customer actually wants and being able to relate to the customer and ultimately the consumer because, you know, you can do a lot of stuff. But if someone's going to – if people don't consume what you're making, it doesn't go anywhere, you know. So getting – getting to know that person, getting to understand what they're prepared to pay for and why, what their motivation is, you know, what um, what's special to them, you know, what they want. Uh, and and the other side of it is how, being able to actually engage with people because, you know, um, at the coalface, that's where it happens, you know. So it just, you know, I, I look at... Um, I go into retail now. I mean, I love going shopping, food shopping and stuff like that. My wife hates taking me shopping because I, she says, she would say to me, you chat to all these randoms, you know. I, do you well, loiter and they, like loiter just well, chatting with everyone? I talk to people about why, you know, why do they buy that? What's what's in your trolley? You know, what are you shopping for? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it might sound a bit weird, but, you know, <laughs> it's... Uh, it's like sifting through. Yeah, yeah, someone else's trolley. Um, <laughs> But, but it's interesting, you know, just looking at what people buy and how they buy. Um, and, I, you know, 
more than that. You know, you, you go into, I mean, we used to do a lot of work with the supermarkets around where you place a product, how you place it, how you package it, all that sort of stuff. And I think people, you know, they're genuinely surprised when you really take them down that journey about how much science there is in all that stuff because it is a real industry. You know, it's um, there's a lot of really um, important lessons in there for people who are developing products around, you know, how do I actually physically get this into someone's hand? Who is the buyer? I guess it's it's it, it's it's a lot of um, human behaviour, isn't it? Too like what mm. triggers people? What mm. are they? What are they after? What you know, what sort of? And even things like and I'm no expert, but like I guess where it's placed on the shelf is it eye level? Is it here? Yeah. Is it there? I imagine there's a whole there's a lot of science behind it. Yeah, you walk you walk into an aisle, the first three feet is invisible to you. You can't see it. Is that right? Because <laughs> you, you haven't quite got your perspective right. Or no, you, no. When well, you look forward, you don't you don't look for that bit. So if you go yeah. into an aisle. What's first? Well, it's always going to be a really high volume product because that first three feet's essentially dead. You can't see it. Mm. So yeah, just all. So if you're, you know, depending on what your product is and where you want to be in respect of the market leader or a competitive product, you know, you, you just really need to think about that stuff. And it's, um, I, you know, I can think of a lot of battles over the years, you know, and really sophisticated stuff, you know, highly you know, really, really high-functioning computer models around placement, product placement, you know, turnover per unit of shelf and all that sort of stuff. And, um, yeah, you know, the the big companies spend a lot of money on making sure they understand that because ultimately it's choosing your product versus or someone else's. Yeah. Just on that, we, we so have just jumped forward 20 years, but that's fine. Um because there's, there's um, the largest supermarkets kind of they determine shelf space, don't they? Like if you're if you you got a product, they go, you know, we'll give you X amount of space. And some supermarkets, I don't know whether the whether the producers, the suppliers, have to kind of even pay for shelf space before they then sell the product. Is that kind of a thing that happens? I mean, I guess my point is, is it is it maybe getting to the stage where it's a little a little. Um, bit of overreach in terms of product placement and, and how that affects or, you know, the competition between products on a shelf in a supermarket? Uh, look, well, so in Australia, I, well, I've been dealing with the supermarkets for a long, long time and they don't generally charge you for shelf space here. They do in America. If you, if you want, um, you know, you want to get, product on a shelf, you generally have to give them a couple of cartons of each product. That's essentially the cost of getting in. So if you're going to oh, get yeah. into a couple of hundred supermarkets, it's a lot of dough. Um, in terms of, you know, do they determine where things go, it, it's generally something that's worked out with the, with the people that are actually operating in the segment. So, you know, and the bigger the company, uh, generally you'll have more influence, obviously, because you've got more products and, you, and you've and you probably got someone specialised in space management, which is what it's called. Mm. Um, but, look, it is a real skill. And, you know, laying that out and getting, uh, you know, a good place and, in fact, even helping the retailer get a better layout, they'll get better revenue. And, you know, it's all about revenue. It's all about turnover per square foot. So, you know... Um, yeah, it is a real science. That's a real, it, it's another, you know, I think, um, you know, if you went back sort of 20 or 30 years, it probably wouldn't have been it, things that are, the way you engage with a supermarket has really changed. It used to be you just sold a product. Now it's about shelf space. It's about logistics. It's about supporting their business. Um, let's go back. <clears throat> let's go back in time a little further. So off the farm, off the farm at twelve, still still had connection with the farm, um, into more urban kind of dwellings. Then school. How, how was how was school? Was that was that formative as well? That, that sort of secondary school was that where you were forming ideas of life, or you don't have much recollection of it, or were you just like Tom catting out in the you know out every weekend and. Um, Wagging school? No. <laughs> I, I'd have been racing around playing parlor cross. That's what I'd have been doing on the weekends. You were? Mm. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, no, that was that was my passion at school. Um, but, um, uh, look, I always, it was interesting. I, I'd always stayed really close to food. I had a lot of, I mean, the school I went to, Chev, you know, 
We had then, it was a boarding school. I don't actually don't think it's a boarding school anymore. I don't think they have boarders anymore. But most of those um, kids that were boarders, you know, they were all from rural areas. There was very few from urban areas. So there was always a big sort of ag focus. Um, I was pretty fortunate that when I went to uni, there was actually quite a lot of people from the Southern Highlands that actually were at the same uni. And, you know, um, agriculture and farming and stuff was always... I did quite a bit of stuff in sort of um, rural ag, uh, rural economics, ag economics, that sort of stuff at uni. So, yeah, I think it was, you know, latter part of school I was right into economics. I've always been right into maths and I've always just had a passion for business and the business always sort of revolved around ag, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah, and, and I think that was sort of, you know, when you think about it, everything that comes out of agriculture is really, it's either food or fibre and that's what it is. I'm just jotting down some quotes here, Murray. Um, so finished up school, 18, I guess, or thereabouts, mm-hmm. and you said your first job was at 22. So was there some uni in there? Well, actually, I when I, I actually start, I actually got a scholarship at the Reserve Bank when I finished school. I went and worked at the Reserve Bank in economic research, actually. Mm, I was... Uh, so is that... No, no, keep going. Keep yeah, on. yeah. So I... So the economic... So the research department of the Reserve Bank and I was in charge of the Invisibles account of the balance of payments. Hmm. <laughs> Which, <laughs> what is the Invisibles account? Well, actually, back then, it wasn't <laughs> much at all. Should I, should, I don't, I, I, do you, are you, have you changed your name since then? Are you, are you, are you, is this a safe house or something? <laughs> You've been living a different so, life ever since then. Well, I'll give you a quick, I'll give you a quick um, uh, lesson in, in, uh, the balance of payments. So there's imports, exports, and so there's goods and services, right? And today, you know, one of the biggest parts of our balance of payments is services, right, which is invisible. It's not a, not a physical, so it's not like buying a warship or something like that, right? So a big or an aircraft, something, a big item, or you're selling rocks or whatever, right? So um, it was sort of interesting because the balance of payments was really what they gave to the junior because there wasn't much in it. You know, it was really about interest rates and movements of money and stuff like that um, compared to, you know, imports or exports or specific parts of those um, categories. Yeah, so I um, I got into that and worked at the Reserve Bank for a few years. And um, so the deal with the Reserve Bank was you studied, if you did well, they put you through the balance of uni. Um, and I really enjoyed it. It was great. But I was really interested in parts of economics that they just weren't really interested in. I was interested in getting into computing and um, did a fair bit of work sort of in computing or introductory computing and then sort of more sophisticated computing and that wasn't something the bank valued. So I just sort of, and the Reserve Bank was, you know, economics is, I've always really liked it. I've always been interested in it, but really it was sort of a bit dry for me and I probably wasn't as academic as they really wanted in terms of that whole economic bit, I was really interested in markets, um, which is what I do today. Right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I stayed there for a few years and then left, finished uni, did the courses I wanted to do and then went into food. And so first your internship at um, Cadbury, Schweppes. Mm. Was it Cadbury, Schweppes then? Was it? Yeah, was yeah, it, was it, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Because mm. um, I guess it, once upon a time they were separate. There was Schweppes. Is Schweppes an Australian company? Um, well, no, they, so... Schwebvessens. Yeah, that's right. So they were, they were English then. Oh, okay. So they, yeah, so Cadbury, I'm not sure, I think it was Cadbury Schweppes in the UK then, but certainly Cadbury Schweppes here and for most of the world. And, um, yeah, so I started there. And then was that, did that, was that a bit of a theme? I noticed on your LinkedIn account, mm. I checked it out oh, today, but right. I did some research there. Uh, and other stuff. Other stuff I Googled, and you were clearly young and needed the money back then. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, what you what, you worked with some other um, large food Yeah, so I had done, sort of went through, did some time with PepsiCo, and sort of, you know, and Pepsi have, well, they they were then, and I think they still are today, you know, one of the largest snack foods companies in the world. Because they so, do a lot more than just. Yeah, a lot yeah. more than just beverages. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Um, Frito Lay, which is, uh, I think it's independent of Pepsi now. I don't actually know, but um, they had a business in Australia, and 
they were just a they were a great company. They were really really good. We were um, Coca Cola Amateur were the largest company in that segment. We were second, but we were a real thought leader. And it was just and the guy that was the uh, CEO there at the time, who's Gordon Cairns, who is the still the chairman of Woolworths today, just a terrific thinker, a really really clever man, and and a great person, really nice bloke. Um, but he always used to, you know, really drive, you know, try and get a real sort of intellectual engagement with your customer. And yeah, it's been one of the things that I really loved. It was we we achieved some really really good things there, and you know right the way back to the potato grower, all the way through, you know, really thinking about how you actually worked with that whole supply chain and you know, bring it through really, really good quality, package it up, you know. You can have a view about the, and, and even my view has changed, you know, sort of over time about the health nature of those sorts of products. Oh, it was basically chips, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah potato chips chip. and all yeah. those sorts of things. And, you know, and they weren't, they weren't huge in grocery then, I suppose they, you know, sort of, Late 80s, they really, you know, really started to take off. And then sort of in the 90s, lots of innovation in packaging and, you know, you could get shelf life, you know, significant advancements in shelf life, which just gives you much more capacity at the retail level, you know. So, you know, we did some really innovative things in terms of packaging types that became recyclable and all that sort of stuff. And and that, that all that sort of stuff just really appeals to me. And we were the second second biggest company in that space, but we were the thought leader. We drove all of the layouts in the stores. We we were king of all those things because we just outthought our competitors. Yeah. And so Aussie potatoes? Mm, oh, yeah. Yeah, all, all, all Aussie, Australian. Aussie based. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All Australian manufactured, yeah. Because arts went into the snack food yeah, you yeah, know, in a big way yeah. and then they sort of in and out a bit. They had um, Doritos mm-hmm. and then they had um, – they were doing like, ruffles and all sorts of different yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Way back then, I thought would they would they have been one of your competitors? I guess. Uh, no, I, I think that that, that Arnott's business became Frito Lay in Australia. Really? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, there was well, Arnott's Snack Foods was was the business that I was in, so it was called Arnott's, but it was I don't think Arnott's owned it. Did they? It was well, it was brand was branded Arnott's because I know yeah. the other because I remember ruffles and and, yeah, and then yeah. it, then sometimes. Oh, I don't know. It was, yeah, it was, um, it's, it's, it's so funny. It's long time. Sometimes it's funny you see the same packet, but it's got a different brand. I remember Weston's Wagon Wheels. I think Arnott's were making Westerns for a yep. while there. And they were sort of competition at some point. Yeah. Uh, the trials and tribulations. Um, so, so any other, oh, I can probably tell you, you know, I'm not going to, not going to say Nestle. You were with Nestle? Yes, yeah, so I know. We've worked for Nestle for, well, Worked in the dairy sector, and so that so I worked really in dairy. From uh, I was with um, was it uh, Pacific Dunlop? They had a huge play in food in Australia, so they owned lots of food businesses here. So Peter's Ice Cream and uh, Yo Play and a whole different sorts of things. So yeah, we so really got into sort of dairy, and then that business we sold it into Nestle, which was a which, yeah, it was a really, it was an exciting time. I mean, working for someone like Nestle is really, you know, they're just, um, I mean, just such a massive business and a huge focus on nutrition and health and food of every type. You know, you can, everything, well, really in the business then, there was everything from pet care stuff to water to dairy to pastas to sauces, you name it. I mean, just a massive business. And, um, yeah, so... Um, but Pacific Dunlop, they had they were putting together a lot of Australian uh, food or yeah Australian food brands or Australian food businesses, which was interesting because I you know it was it's you know really sort of since the nineties it's been harder and harder to actually find good Australian businesses to work in in food other than sort of privately owned ones you know the international ones a lot of them have been bought out. Um, we'll get to but what is. So there's a, there's a when I look at Nestle and and Frito Lay Frito Lay mm, Frito Lay right. um, Cadbury and so on they don't sort of they don't scream at me um, good solid nutritious fresh food do no, they no they don't and but now and we'll get to <clears throat> the next well the, your your current chapter of your life Murray there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a different theme going on there yeah. was there a point at which you kind of stood back from those years in in that industry that you know um, that 
dare I say, processed food industry mm. and went, oh, I, I want to do something different because you were bored with it or you went, I don't, this doesn't feel good anymore or you, I don't know, what was there a pivot, pivot yeah. point there? Tom? Yeah, there was. It was actually, it was interesting. Um, we, um, so we had, when I was with um, with Peter's, we had this fantastic business. It was like we had 40,000 customers around the country. We had a really big logistics business, all frozen, you know, and fantastic relationships with our customers. We sold that business to Nestle and it was amazing. We lost so much business the day we sold it. And we couldn't we couldn't work out why. Went and had a chat to some customers and we started to realise, oh, okay, there's a history here. And so so we lost business because of things that Nestle had done in Africa in 1970 and stuff like that. Yeah. And it so I, I stayed with Nestle for a while and then just made the choice, you know, because it was really such a big international business. I've got four daughters. My wife and I at the time, we sort of went, oh, we're not going to go overseas. We're not going to take these girls to Asia or Africa. Or with, with, with the Nestle kind of. Yeah, because the, that's that's really yeah. the, the sort of journey they want you to go on, you know, they, particularly, you know, if you if you delivering for them in the business and you speak English, they want to move you around the world, right, because it's it's an easy formula for them. Getting on that's pretty easy. Um, getting home is hard. And uh, the fellow I worked for, uh, he was in Vevey in Switzerland and uh, his family lived in Bondi. And I thought, no, that's not for me. So, um, yeah, so stayed there for a while and then um, tried to find uh, an Australian-based business and um, sort of ended up, uh, again, staying in dairy, moved across into Bond Lake in Victoria. Mm. And then you, you, and then there, at some point you found your way up here to Norco. Yeah, yeah. So still dairy, yeah, still dairy. Yeah. How's Norco? Uh, look, it was, um, you know, it's a. Uh, I don't know much about the business today. Um, I imagine it's had a tough year with the floods and things in Lismore. But um, um, look, it's a you know, Australian-owned cooperative business seems to be doing pretty well. We had some fun there. It was good. Yeah, yeah. and you know that. When I got there, the business or the dairy sector had really just um, gone through deregulation, which is a huge change coming from a regulated environment to an unregulated environment. So, um, yeah, lots of change for those farmers. But, you know, it's still a, well, I think today it's probably the only cooperative business in dairy that's still operating. And, you know, they've been fortunate to hold on to those assets. I think it's the oldest cooperative in Australia, isn't it? Oh, it would be today. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And they've they've been quite active up here in the Northern Rivers in terms of um, putting on. I know it did some work with them, um, or sort of vicariously through a Landcare Group, Brunswick yeah. Bay Landcare Group, up here last year, last May. They put on a series of days where they were involved in talking about regenerative farming practices and soil, and it was fantastic. And it was really it was great to see them there as a um, uh, as a supporter of that. And and I think they've got some good good. Um, just, just very supportive of their farmers. I know that one of the one of the one of the policies is that they. And I'm not sure how many years ago it was was um, put in place. I think Rose Wright at Regionality might have had something to do with mm-hmm. that. They can they can there's a percentage of their milk they, that Norco are okay for them to turn into their own cheese or value added sort of stuff, which is was a refreshing kind of approach to it all, as opposed mm-hmm. to you will sell every litre to us. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's a, it's always a challenge though because it's you know you've got. You've got to sort of drive the efficiency of the co-op, but you've really got those good local farmers who actually want to support what they're doing locally. Yeah. Um, now the, I think that sort of before I finished up there, there was plenty of people starting to talk about doing exactly that. Mm. Well, they did, and I think that was a, that was a wonderful thing because so many, um, you know, it's just I guess in a lot of businesses it's a value add that makes up, you know, the difference, you know, the a better margin, and and it's you know, and it puts a bit of a story back into the farming situation too. In dairy, where there've been lots of ups and downs, and and um, to be just sort of producing milk um, is not. I mean, there's a story there, but to be able to make cheese or butter or whatever else, to you, I think that's um, that's really important. Um, now, Murray, you've got a bit of a story. Tell us about your most recent. Um, you've just got back from. You literally got back from overseas today. I did. I got back this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He looks pretty fresh, though, I've got to say. 
I'll be wrong for another half. <laughs> okay, I'll keep an eye on that. <laughs> yeah, I'll prod him. I should. I should have brought a lighter or something to, yeah, to, to prod you to get you if you start failing. Tell us about why you went over there. Uh, yeah, look. What at prompted me. you? Well, it's sort of interesting. You know, it's um, sort of that continuing on. You know, sort of. I've always been really interested in. So you know, if you if you're in food in Australia, you, you know, you really ultimately you get closer and closer to where's the raw material come from. You know, you get right back into that. I think as you sort of, you know, uh, well, for me anyway, as I've gotten older, I've been more interested in how my food's grown, where it comes from, how healthy it is. We, you know, we're not a huge consumer of processed food. We've gone more and more towards unprocessed food sort of in the last 15 years. It's just been a natural progression. You're saying we as in? Well, just my family. Your family, okay, yeah, personally. Family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And, um, you know, things like, you know, just the way you, the sort of utensils you have in your kitchen, the sort of tools you buy, all that sort of stuff. It's actually just been much more about a different focus on the food we eat. And my daughters are certainly very focused on that. So, yeah, we um been in America in the last uh, couple of weeks chatting to uh, our customer over there and we, you know, have a structured supply chain that we operate for them here. And... Um, the vast majority of the farm, it's, it's not a regenerative certified program at this stage, but it's certainly something that we're looking at. And the, and we've been drawn to that firstly because the customer's interested in it, but more importantly, um, the farms that we bring into the program are increasingly actually looking at it. So we're getting, you know, buy-in on that from both sides, which is terrific. Um, when we started this a couple of years ago, we certainly didn't start it with the view to make it a regenerative supply chain we were looking at it as a different business model that we thought suited the farms. Um, but the farms have sort of taken us there and the customer is actually now starting to say our, our consumers are actually really interested in this. So, it's yeah, it's been a really good convergence of um, the farms interested in it and also the consumers interested in it. You better tell us what product it is. Well, it's grass-fed, <laughs> it's grass-fed beef, yeah. So it's a grass-fed beef program. Um which is uh, which is dear to both our hearts, um, yes. but yeah, no, it's um, so we we're just focused on um, good British breed, you know, no antibiotics, no hormones, all those different sorts of things, uh, and uh, grass fed product into the US. So, how does that work? Do you want to explain for our listeners? Because I suspect there'll be a few farmers out there um, listening who'd be interested in um, in in some of the, not all the detail, of course, but just sort of the concept of it. How does yeah. it, it kind of work? Yeah, so we um. So the way that we run it is that we um, we own the animals. So we provide animals that suit the properties uh, that obviously suit the customer specification, and um, we cover all the costs of those animals. We pay uh, a fee to the farmer to actually grow the animal for us, and then we, uh, when they're ready, we take the animals, slaughter them here in Australia, um, cut them into primals and trim and whatever, and then ship them to the US either frozen or uh, all the primals go over and chilled. Um, we have a, a dedicated cutting arrangement with a, uh, a processor in the US, so it's all shipped to Philadelphia at the moment. We cut it there and then freeze it into um, uh, individual portions and it's delivered to home. So it's all a home-delivered package. It's not, it's, uh, not a retail package. Um, and, it, look, it's a, it's a great way of actually sort of being able to hold uh, all of those attributes in the product and actually talk right to the end consumer about what we're doing here. And all of the products going into that supply chain at the moment comes out of Australia. So it's a, you know, it's a grass-fed program operating in the USA and it's all Australian beef. They sell turkey and pork and chicken and things which they source domestically, but all of their beef comes out of Australia. And that's for it to be... Um identified as an Australian product, grass-fed and and somewhat traceable. Is that, that's, for what I understand, a bit of a novelty over there. Yeah, look, it's, um, it is. On the scale that Australia does it, uh, it's really trusted. And that's, you know, that's uh, a huge asset for us. The, look, there's grass-fed product in the US. Um, you'd probably argue that the Australian product is significantly better quality, which is why we have the opportunity there. Um, but there is no, you know, the, the systems that are in place in the USA are just not as trusted 
it's a it's really interesting chatting to um, customers and consumers over there. There's a real distrust in the food system, and you know, it's just a, as an example. I mean, look, they have some climatic challenges in the US, obviously, because you know there's a heap of snow there, and so you. But a lot of grass-fed product or product that's sold as grass-fed is actually fed pelletized grass in feedlots, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's how they sort of sneak it. Oh, it's grass fed. Con. Well, it's grass fed, but it's not free to roam. It's you know, it's confined. It's it's eating grass, but it's not like grazing it. Grazing. Right. That's right. You know. So it's. <laughs> and that's, 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 well, there's some there's some real nuances in that. I mean, the US is a you know, it's got its own um, sort of programs, but they they run programs like an all natural program, but it'll be naturally grain fed, which. You know, it's a, it sounds silly to us, but it's the way the market's developed. Looking for more information to assist your regenerative journey? Come join Charlie and his guests around the kitchen table, an online community of supporters with exclusive access to the regenerative journey interview transcripts, live online Q&A sessions, a chance to engage with other like-minded people and more. Go to www.charliearnett.com.au forward slash the kitchen table. And if you're not totally satisfied with the value of your membership and wish to cancel it within the first two months, we will give you a full 100% refund. No questions asked. Now let's get back to this week's episode. I was just going to go back to um, – I'll just talk about cows because I just saw – I was just looking at the video here and you, you were going to talk about that cow in the background there for a minute. <laughs> can, you go, can you explain that one? I'm, yep. just, I'm, I'm pleased that there's a cow that, 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 uh, in, in, in the, the backdrop for, for our viewers. Yeah, so, so behind us is a, uh, is a picture which I actually bought uh, – it, it's the 30 years ago, I suppose, but I was skiing in the US with some friends actually. It's a – the picture, the picture is actually called the CI test. So it's a picture of a cow looking at a picture of cows um, in an art gallery. And it's actually in the Chicago Art Gallery. Um, and it's the most, I don't know, it just really captivated me. I love it. It's a really nice. Uh, Beautiful cow. Yeah. It's a, a dairy looking cow. So, yeah. But no, it's a. Uh, is that a pencil or is that etch, etched? No, no, no. Not, no, not it's a a, no, it's a painting. Yeah, yeah. fairly good. Yeah. But yeah, no. So um, always, always being captivated by cows. Back to high end beef um, and cows. Why? Do, why you mentioned there before, Murray, that you when you how 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 long have you been with high end beef? When did it originate? Uh, well, I started it. So I'm I'm a major shareholder in the business, and um, we started it in uh, probably oh, seven years ago, mm. and. Um, we we started running a program into Indonesia originally. Um, we've we've always been interested in trying to build supply chains for customers. So we, you know, we're not a, a traditional meat business. We're not a, a processor as such. You know, we only own animals that are essentially part of a supply chain for a customer. Um, so we're not a you know a general seller of meat. We don't have any excess. All of the animals in our system are spoken for and have a home. Um, we, you know, you know, and we, um, I suppose the original idea for the business really came about because, you know, over the years you realise that there's a real challenge on farm between assets and cash. And, you know, if you can do anything to actually free up cash on farm to actually put that cash back into productivity, that was always interested, interesting to me. And, um, you know, so, you know, a lot of farms are very, um, asset rich, but they're not actually cash rich. And so finding a way to actually, um, you know, get around that, what can we actually provide to the farm? Well, we can provide capital. So we provide the capital, we provide the herd, we provide all of the costs. So it's essentially, you know, a, a guaranteed income from uh, a capital free item on your farm. That's the way we look at it. And, you know, it's been, um, been well received. I think the uh, you know certainly the capital side of it is really interesting to farms. The no price risk piece is probably becoming more important to farms. Um, it depends what sort of farm you're in, you know, because it doesn't you know it doesn't work for all farms. But we find that 
um, we've become an important part of all the farm's business. We don't want to be a whole business, but, you know, if you've got your own beef operation and you run our beef operation alongside it, you've essentially got almost a guaranteed income out of our business and you've got your own trading income. So, you know, when you think about the structure of most businesses, you, having multiple revenue streams is really important. So if you can have a revenue stream that's essentially independent of market risk, that's huge. Well, I've spoken with a couple, a couple of your farmer, um, your farm farmers, I guess, and grass suppliers, uh, and they've said exactly that, that there's a, there's a real attraction to not having to find the money in the first place because yeah. to get one animal, to buy an animal now is pretty much two or three times what it used to be, you That's know, right. three or four years ago. Yeah. So you've got to have a better relationship with the bank and go into more debt potentially to do the same thing. And as I said, the price risk is the other thing where um, you aren't going to get as much per kilo of, you know, if you'd bought it, but however, you didn't have to find the money in the first place and you, at the end of the day, you're not looking at the, the market every week going, Gee whiz, I better bloody sell them and they're not ready, but I better get a better bush them because the price is going down and all that, and that which has caused a huge, huge amount of stress. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so, so again, budgeting, it's a bit of an over, as long as you can put the weight on and you can be, you know, I guess reasonably conservative in your budgeting, then it's a, it is a no brainer. And these guys, one in particular said, you know, he sort of, it accounts for 25, 25% of his, of his business. And that, that for him, his bank manager was very pleased about. It. Yeah. And his account. Yeah, I bet. I mean, it's, um, look, we, you know, it's always interesting, you know, what, what is the rate of return? So we've done a lot of work on this and we sort of looked at it over a cycle and said, okay, well, if, uh, if the rate of return is going to be this, we'll actually pay that plus a small premium because obviously you want to be able to, you know, um, strip or look at, all of the costs that relate to a transaction, be really honest about those costs and then actually say, okay, um, how does that compete over the cycle? Because you only bank the average, right? I mean, everyone has good transactions and bad transactions, but you bank the average. So we looked at the average and then added a small premium to it because, you know, it's it's a grass-fed product. We want to be at about 500 kilos at slaughter, you know, um, you know, you're essentially competing with feedlot entries and all those different sorts of things that are going to be at around that 400 to 450 sort of level. So obviously getting an animal through to that 500 kilo just takes a bit more time. So, you know, it's worth a little bit more. You mentioned before, um, Murray, that you didn't go into it necessarily to sort of um, focus on regenerative farmers and, and, and have them in the system and, and supplying grass essentially. Mm-hmm. Why, did it, why has it gone that way? And where, and where is it going and why? Well, it's gone that way. Interestingly, so we were just really fortunate, I think. Um, you know, about 70% of the farms that came into the program initially, you know, they might not have described their business practices as regenerative, but when we went around and had a look at them, we noticed that they were pretty well the same. You know, and so, you know, we've got plenty of them that would, they would probably say, yes, they're regenerative. We've got some that would say they're, you know, they're using, utilising most of those practices, but they wouldn't necessarily align with that word regenerative. We've got one who was one of the first guys I spoke to about it, and he simply said to me, I farm naturally, which I've always really, I've sort of held on to that because I sort of look at, I look at a lot of the things that are happening in our supply chain and I just say, okay, well, if it's, you know, if it aligns with what would happen naturally in this environment, then, you know, that's going to be, Firstly, I think it's a good way of marketing things. And secondly, I think it's actually a much more sort of dependable business model to follow. So that, you know, the first thing was we started to realise that that's where the farms were. And there was a lot of common sort of learnings coming out of the farms. You know, we obviously, if you're in a grass program, you need to get good, consistent weight gains. That varies over the season naturally, over the seasons. Um, But just talking to the farms about, the different pasture types they were using, the different, you know, how they were actually moving the animals, what they were doing. We then started to talk to the customers in America and they were really intrigued by it. We started to send them pictures and a few little videos of moving days when you're moving the herd and all that sort of stuff and it just escalated. So, you know, we sort of realised, okay, well, we've got, you know, a group of farms here that have really got a story that can be marketed right the way through to the consumer. And we've got a consumer over there who's really engaged. 
So between, I mean, the way we, you know, we we are a supply chain business. We've got a, a very sophisticated computer back end that runs our business right from farm right through to logistics and delivery into the U.S., and it's interesting. So our our customers in the US would say our business is all about transparency, you know, and it's about them being able to see in, go right down to the farm, you know, have a sense of the audit process, have a sense of the lifetime traceability, surety, all of those different sorts of things. Um, and, you know, I just think it's the interest from both ends of the supply chain, Charlie, in, in um a sense of how their food is actually being grown and nurtured and them being confident about us being able to deliver that. And and, and I, I think that, you know, we, we are very transparent about the way we relate to them and, you know, we you could probably say in some, in some ways we're probably too transparent, you know, and there is a bit of a risk of that. But, look, it's not become an issue for us, but... Um, you know, we're very, very open we, we, and we put everything out straight away and I think that just, it just um, encourages this real honesty in the supply chain around, okay, well, what's here? What are you selling? Um, you're not hiding behind anything. And that is really appealing to consumers. And if, particularly if you're looking for, you know, a, a box of, uh, you know, various types of proteins each week that's being delivered to your farm, you're you're prepared to pay a premium for that. Sorry, to your home, you're prepared to pay a premium for that, and you want good quality product. Do you think the American consumers generally are, are more discerning? Um, is are they because transparency is probably not as um, not not as much of a thing over there as it possibly is here in Australia with with traceability? Do you think they're 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 more excited, or there's 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 more of an interest, you know, than than here generally. Um, as as a trend, you know, as as that as the eaters of the world. Um, look, I don't I don't know if there's more interest there. I, I mean, it's you know, it's such a big market. I mean, that's the thing. You know, it's if it's the same percentage of people here, it's it's a it's a lot of millions of people over there that have an interest in this, and I think that's probably part of it too. There's just more. Everywhere you go, people talk to you about it, you know, and it's top of mind for them. So whether it's, you know, whether it's animal welfare or whether it's um, traceability, I mean, they're all just really, they're very attuned to it. They're they're really interested in it. They'll ask about it. Um, I think the fact that, I mean, Australia just has a good reputation around these things. I think our our basic offering, and that might be the wrong way to describe it, but our sort of... Um, you know, the base level offering that we have in Australia is a very, very high standard. And and I think that's the thing, like, you know, the standards across the states in America vary a lot. There is no uniformity. And I think that really helps us. You know, things like the NLIS, um, you know, there are small variations in, you know, in state requirements in respect of, you know, uh, that system in some ways. But it's really, you know... It, it's a standard across the country that everyone uses, and and that's that's something you just can't get in America. You just can't get that across fifty states. And we've talked to people over there about that. They don't think you'll ever get it. And you know, if that's the case, that's a huge opportunity for Australia. Totally. Mm. Stepping away from that for a minute, Murray, back to your dad, mm-hmm. who was a signwriter. He was a signwriter. Yeah. So he was artistic. Really, yeah, yeah, very, yeah. We had the most, you know, you know, when you, uh, back then you used to have like the phone book and you used to have a little table with the phone on it. Well, our phone book, you couldn't see any numbers. <laughs> he would sit scribble. there on the phone <laughs> and he would just, and he'd draw, you know, and there'd be a picture of a horse or there would be a picture of, you know, uh, a table that he was doing up or something, you know. It was always scrolls and beautiful stuff, you know. Yeah, he just had a. A terrific, and he and he and he did it all freehand. Like it was, even like right up until oh, probably only a couple of years before he passed away. Like he was still writing sign, and he would people would come to him and ask him to actually paint a sign rather than print it out of you know um, vinyl like they do today. So yeah, I mean he he did do a bit of that vinyl stuff, but he hated it. He loved nothing more than, and I've still got his mole stick out the back, but he loved nothing more than sitting there with a. Um, you know, a paintbrush. And his paintbrushes were really expensive, like super, super expensive. And he had them, they were, 
I, in fact, my oldest daughter has got them all, but um, like they were very old and, you know, had this way of oiling them all and, you know, it was a real, it was a real job to actually get that paint working perfectly. It was good. That was his, that were his tools. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what's your artistic kind of outlet, Murray? Uh, Can you draw? No. No, I'm hopeless. <laughs> My oldest daughter, Riley, got all of the art that went through me. It, 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 it jumped a generation. <laughs> it jumped a generation. Classic. Uh, yeah, no, look, no, my, well, my passion is uh, is heavy horses, actually. That's, that's, my passion goes to horses, yeah. I think that's where my artistic bit is. Heavy horses as in the draft horses, the... Yeah, Clydes. The mm. Clydes. Have you got any here? No, I don't have any here, but I do up in Tenerfield. Mm. Tenerfield. So why, what happened, what happened there? So that we, <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we wanted somewhere, you know, uh, out of the humidity here. So now we've got a property up in Tenerfield that we've, uh, uh, we're we're starting to work on, and um, we're about to do our footprint on, and really sort of start to get into that as our sort of project for for Anne and I. It's really exciting. Mm. So it's a it's a block of land that uh, it's got um, beautiful, uh, untouched um, woodland areas. It's got a really nice pinnacle there that's over a thousand feet at the top. Yeah, so really high, and. Um, Magnificent native grasses and all that sort of stuff. It'll it'll you know graze a few animals. So you know, we're really looking forward to getting into it and seeing what we can do with it. I don't know that my Clyde style and I will do a lot of work to transform it. But, <laughs> um, he's he's broken to chains and it's just uh, oh look I love it. It's you know they're just magnificent animals. They're huge and yeah. Have you done that with the plough like with the mm. the whole thing? Have you got one up there? I've got one, one here. here. I don't really? have one up there, no. Um, was well, no good down here, no, Murray. No. You better take it up there. I know, I've got to get it up there. But, um, yeah, no, um, I've done it a few times. I actually, I grew some garlic here a couple of years ago and um, we, we registered a brand, Clyde Style Garlic. Uh, it wasn't a huge success. It was very small. But, no, I loved it. I mean, it's. I had a Clyde Style here for a while and uh, we had to put a sign up at the corner to say, please don't feed him because people would just stop. <laughs> and, uh, like, because they're just such magnificent, mm. majestic animals, and they're they're just incredibly friendly. Yeah. Um, business mantra, Murray. You you've been you. This is a double barrel question. Really. Do, you, do you consider yourself as a like a fixer, like a business kind of? Is that something you enjoy doing? Going into a business, maybe not purposely to fix it, or maybe you were sort of put into businesses to to, to fix them. Is that something that you sort of think you're good at? Um. Yeah, I I'm not a um, don't be I, humble. No, no, no. Um, I'm not a I'm not a sort of a uh, a tear businesses apart, fix them sort of person. I'm I'm much like, look. I'm I'm pretty quick to move when I see things that need to change in a business. You know, and and strategically, I think I think people sometimes complicate strategy in businesses. You know, it's generally a strategy is very straightforward. You know, it's pretty it's pretty obvious. How do you implement that is quite complex. I'm actually, the thing I get a real buzz out of, Charlie, is not so much changing businesses, but it's having them operate day after day really, really well. And I think that's, like, you can always change things, but having something that operates over a period of time really well is hard to do, you know, have consistent performance. And, you know, um, that's, that's what really gets me Going, that's what I really like. So building business processes, building systems that are repeatable and reliable, and that's that is hard work. You know, a lot of people um, really, you know, enjoy the change and you know doing something repetitively. And and it's you know we're in food, we're in you know we're, we're dealing with nature all the time, so nothing's ever repeated the same. You've always got to do with what the climate or the environment's throwing at you. So you might be doing, you, you're still after the same outcome, which is product, right? But you've got to deal with all of those other factors in the middle, so it's never the same. But but getting business systems that actually are reliable enough um, to be able to deliver time after time, that's what I really like. Do you have any business mantras, like sort of go-to phrases or kind of, you know, principles, top three principles that you can kind of that are just that apply to whether you've got a farm or a bloody paint factory or a, is there anything that you sort of like your your cornerstone, um, you know, mantras. Well, you can look, steal them from someone else. Too. 
Well, well, a couple of things. I mean, I think you've always got to understand the numbers. You've got to be really honest about them. We've, it's been interesting since we started Highland Beef. You know, we've had um, lots of conversations around kitchen tables with people and, and that's a really good way to, you know, get that engagement because you're really, you're talking about, you know, being a business partner with someone, you know, we're, we're a long way away from them. So, you know, you've got to have a good relationship with them. They've got a lot of our assets on their properties. So, you know, it's a big relationship to have. But you've got to be really honest about the numbers. And we've, we've seen plenty of examples where, you know, people will say to us, oh, yeah, um, in fact, we've, you know, we've had lots of tears around the tables because we think, oh, okay, this is the outcome. But they're actually saying to us, no, well, the outcome's actually worse than that, you know. You know, because they're just ultimately sometimes they're just not honest about what the real costs are. You know, people generally want to talk to you about what revenue is, but are you really honest about the costs? So I'm a real driver for, you know, making sure you understand the numbers. And, you know, and cash is really important. You know, you don't, you know, a transaction's not finished until you've got the money in the bank. Cash flow. Cash flow. The, 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 um, what is the, not, not the, the blood? No, what is it? The it's basically it, 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 it's just it was well, literally the circulation, it is, isn't it? Of that. Well, you see a lot of profitable businesses, you know, go out of business because they don't have the cash. You know, you might be technically you might actually be making a profit, but if you're not getting paid, if you haven't got the cash, you know, you can't survive. And so, you know, um, getting the cash right, and getting the um, and really understanding the numbers, and it's not just about revenue or cost or profit. You know, a P&L is a living document and it works from top to bottom and you can't look at one bit without the other. So, you know, that, that's really important to me and, and I just think, you know, having a real understanding. And look, so that I suppose that's one. Um, uh, look, I think the other thing is um, having good, frank relationships with your customers is the other thing. You know, it's sometimes it, it's really important to have those difficult conversations and don't put them off. Don't procrastinate. And we all do it from time to time in different parts. But I, you know, that's the one thing I think you've really just got to be on to. Don't procrastinate about things because it doesn't make anything better. Um, you know, you're just putting something off. So get in and do it. Um, and once, once generally once you've taken a stand, it resolves itself, whichever way. But but if you don't take the stand, it doesn't. It just stays there. It's a bit. It's that um, relates to the eating your frogs in the morning, which is a very simple sort of thing. You know, you can procrastinate on something all day, something all day, and it's still going to sit there all day long. And you're not going to be as effective because you're thinking about it. But if you eat those frogs in the morning and make those hard, as you say, hard conversations, or you know, those hard sometimes phone calls or emails or whatever they are, then there's that sense of, I guess, of, of achievement and, and you know, do the, do the tough stuff do, mm. you know, and delayed gratification, I guess, as well, which is like putting up the, putting the easy stuff towards the end because mm. you, you, you might be enjoying it a bit more. Um, and the other thing I would say is, um, which is something that sort of is interesting to both of us, is, is get someone in your business that's a mentor or, or has a different point of view. You know, that, that's really important because, and I've, Actually, in in all the business, all the so before working for myself, all the businesses I've worked in, I've always had you know a real diversity of people at sort of a leadership level because you, you then you know you get challenged, things don't sit there, don't get unsaid, you know, and that's important. And I guess having that clean pair of eyes is no, you know, hopefully no bias, um, no history, no baggage, no paradigms that are they're just seeing things very objectively and and generally without the emotion. And in farming, there's a lot of emotion tied up in um, decision making, isn't there? You know, yeah. like you know, will I? Won't I? Will I? We you know, um, and you know, I guess in a business that is is so full of variables as well, and and that the families live on those farms, you can't really escape that. No, and look, it's. That's right. I mean, when you live in the business, it's sort of interesting. So, you know, we're here at my house. I, I have an office, but it's in a building at the back. And that's really important to me. Like, it, to me, I come inside, that's it, I close the door. Right? Are you good at that? Yeah, I am. Oh, well, I are. Should I speak? You should ask Anne. <laughs> <laughs> you should ask Anne. Um, oh, look, I try to be, but that's, that's why I have it out there. 
you know, because it's um, a not guy I've been, you know, obviously we've all been working at home in the last couple of years, but I'd been working, you know, here for quite a few years before that. And um, I really enjoy it. Um, I try not to bring it in. I mean, it's hard, you know, when you work for yourself, it is hard to separate from that. And it is harder. I think I agree. It's very, very hard in a farming environment because, you know, the relationship to the land is very personal and it's hard, you know. Um, your genius, Murray. What do you what do you think that is? My genius. Your genius. Again, don't be humble. <laughs> uh, um, and this it could be business. Well, it doesn't have to be business related. It, it may be, but it might be more. Yeah, you know, might be a bit, a bit more of a personal thing in there, mm. which they often are. Oh, look, I think uh, look, I think my 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 genius is really around sort of. Uh, it's it's really around sort of process and strategy. That's I, I get really I've always been really frustrated by people that continue to talk about strategic reviews and all this sort of stuff. Uh, strategy for a business is generally unless you're going to make a you know 180 degree move, strategy for a business is generally don't change much. What you got to do to tactically implement that. That changes all the time. But the strategy in your business, you know, you can spend a lot of money and a lot of time worrying about that. And I think the simpler you keep it, the easier it is for everyone to relate to and the easier it is to make decisions, right? Um, I, I, really, I really like that. And it, I've, I've been involved in, I was in a, involved in a listed business probably 10 years ago and I didn't stay there for long because I just sort of, I just could not, uh, get the group there to really understand that, look, you know, you, you, you've actually got a pretty straightforward business here. Here's the competitive environment you're in. You can complicate it all you like and make it sound different, but the reality is you're not making money and this is the space. So that's all there is to it, you know. Um, and you've got to make those decisions pretty quickly because then, you know, you've got a lot of work to do to do other things. So that, that for me, has always been important because I like running businesses. I don't like you know, maybe maybe that's the whole thing. You know, I like running them. I don't like changing them so much. So you've got to know what you've got to run at. Mm. So your genius is kind of implementing strategy, but but, but just but, but, but well, sort defining, of like defining strategy defining, really simplistically. Yeah, yeah. You know? in a, well, not simplistically, but in a really straightforward way. Right? It doesn't have to be complex. And the more you complicate it, it might make you feel good, but I don't think it actually delivers any money. Yeah. You know? Get get it down, make it simple, get on and do it. Because often it can be just like shuffling the deck chairs in the Titanic, isn't it? Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Potentially, yeah. depending on the business and the situation. Yeah, look, and look, it depends. That's right. It does depend on what the situation is because, you know, if it's really dire, well, then, you know, the strategy's got to be pretty drastic. Tell me, horses, um, your girls were keen horse riders because mm-hmm. they you were involved with Bangalore Pony Club, I oh, understand. Nice. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about, tell me about being the father of girls who love horses. I mean, you would love horses too. So I kind of there was a, there was an acceptance of that. But is that because I'm Lila's twelve and she's just mad about horses, and I'm really pleased about that, and for, for a number of reasons. Is that, um, is it, was it a good thing? Oh, I loved it. Actually, it was funny, you know. Um, so my dad, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of kilometres he drove. It's taking me to Polo Cross like every weekend, you know, two horses away we'd go. You know, it's very different back then, you know, sleeping in the back of a horse boat in Bungandore in winter. And we, Ooh. Yeah. Tough. I still remember that. What a good bloke. Yeah. But um, Dad always, uh, Dad's father was a farrier. Um, that That's what he was. That's, that was his job. Um he died in 1942, he, you know, and his job was really, he, he looked after, um, you know, a lot of the horses that made the deliveries in and around Sydney. That's what he did. And um, so Dad always had an affinity with horses. He never rode, not not that I can remember, but he he loved them. We we just had horses, our ho- you know, really, I suppose from, oh, really as long as I can remember, we always had horses around. So, you know, we, we went all out and my uh, sisters and I, and we all rode. And um, when I bought the first horse for my daughters, I rang Dad and told him, 
And I've never heard anyone laugh so. <laughs> I think because he, he, he knew what you were in for. Front of me, right? Uh, he <laughs> laughed. He went, "Oh, really? Okay." Anyway, so the first pony we bought, he's still here. Actually, he's out in the paddock. Yeah, yeah. we've had him for twenty five years. Yeah. And um, all the girls learned to ride on Henry. And actually, Henry went back to Bangalore Pony Club for a couple of years under lease for another family there. And uh, yeah, look, I just. I've always really, what I've always loved about riding is that, you know, I could ride and my, my daughters could keep up with me, you know, so it was something that we could actually do together, right, which I really, really liked to, you know, you go down the beach here and you can ride along Lennox Beach for however many. Can you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, still do it. Yeah. How far yeah. up the beach can you go? Just all around, all... around the back of Lane Ainsworth, you can ride right to Broken Head. Really? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. What about what about Tallows? Can you do it on Tallows? Is oh, it, look, I, maybe... don't, I, don't th- I don't think you can. I'd I don't know. You can go down to the south of Ballina as well and ride along the beach there. But yeah, no. It <laughs> and you have you? Have you done the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's good. Cool. I guess I haven't. Well, I haven't never seen any at um, Tallow. So maybe, and I haven't been to Lennox, to be honest. So not, not the beach at least. Yeah. Is it, sorry, go on. But it's, um, yeah, so no, we've, all the girls have, all the girls ride. And yeah, it's just a, Look, I think I think just having the responsibility of a horse and the relationship with a horse is really special. You know, and it's, it's sort of funny, you know, the whole pony club thing is I can remember days where the girls never even got on a horse. They just played in the horse work with their friends, you know, and it was just, <laughs> and it's just, uh, uh, you know, I think those little community clubs are great. And look, Bangalore's, yeah, you're right, we were there for, um, what did I, I think we started at Bangalore Pony Club in 2004 and we probably finished up five years ago. Wow. Yeah, so by the time my youngest got through. Yeah. Is it true that having girls having ponies, it, it keeps them away from the boys for longer? Is that kind of, is that, is that, was that one of your tactics? <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't one of my tactics. Um, and if, even if it wasn't a tactic, did it well, work? Actually, well, it probably did, but um, it's sort of a shame actually because uh, actually it was interesting. When I went through Pony Club, we, I can remember going through Pony Club and then sort of getting bored with it. And we all then went on to Polo Cross and other things like that. But we always used to go back to Pony Club because it was a great place to actually school your horse and all that sort of stuff, particularly younger horses. Um, but over the years that we were involved in Bangalore, uh, one of the challenges we really had was getting boys there. There was just no boys riding because they'd all go off to camp draft or other things. They were after sort of, you know, faster things to do. Um but yeah, no, that that was never the motivation, Charlie. But it it uh... <laughs> <laughs> it may it may not have worked. Um, we haven't talked about Sado yet. Can we talk about that? Because that yeah. you mentioned mentoring there a minute ago. So let's let's talk about Sado. Mm-hmm. Tell me tell me what that's all about. Yeah. So um, in it would have been two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. Um, Ian Ulrich, who has passed away a few years ago, unfortunately, but. Um, his wife still lives up here, been here for a long while. Um, I met him not long after I came here, and Ian had always been a real advocate for regional stuff and right into the regional food movement, which was terrific. And anyway, he and a group of other friends started to really work on a regional mentoring program. And it was about the time, so it was around sort of the global financial crisis and Kevin Rudd was doing things on, you know, the Golden Gurus program and that sort of thing. Um but there was this sense amongst the group that, and one of the things that we are really blessed with in this region is, as you said before, a lot of people coming to the region, you know, they've been successful somewhere else, they come here or they come here to run a business, they want to give back or they get bored and say, well, what can I do? And so we've always had this terrific pool of people with great knowledge, particularly about business, right? Rather than sort of going down the golden guru's path, we sort of went, well, businesses are different, they're unique, they've all got a pathway. So and and we met in a bakery. So it became sourdough business pathways. And of course, you know, the notion of sourdough is that it's it's growing out of, you know, a living, nurturing thing anyway. It's quite unique. So um and yeah, and you've got a starter that in sometimes has been there for hundreds of years, you know, or a hundred years anyway. So yeah, so Sourdough Business Pathways came from that. Um, we put a group of mentors together, started a first program in probably 2009, and it's been going since. And we've generally got about, oh, somewhere between sort of 60 and 100 mentors on the books and probably 100 businesses that we mentor or mentor each year. And um, 
So we've got a really good program of uh, mentoring. We've got a terrific business women's network set up, which has just been, you know, it's just grown uh, exponentially over the last few years. It's been fantastic. And um, we do a fair bit of stuff in in the startup space and we're actually now running a government program in the region as well. Um, but, you know, I've been involved with that since 2009 and, uh, um, yeah, it's a great program. Works really, really well and we've got, you know, um, it's been, for me, it's sort of, I've never been involved in Lions or anything like that, but my dad was always involved in Apex and he was always in Lions. And, you know, it was all, it, for me, it's always just been a, a great way of giving back to the community. Well, that's how we met, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's think, right. Yeah, 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 some years ago. And through that one, I, I met some wonderful people, yourself included, and Adam Gibson and, and other other mentors and people in the network that, um, and it's it's lovely to see them in the, see them, you know, in the community and then you're sort of tracking them and it's interesting how you'll you'll be talking to someone about a business that's sort of getting off the ground and doing getting underway and doing good things and then you sort of find out, oh, they've been through the the Sado program, you know, which is not I'm not, not surprised because of the quality of the mentors is fantastic and and to have a community of mentors like that to support businesses and there are so many businesses starting up here aren't there oh, as yeah. you said you know this is a bit yeah. of a, a bit of a hub so to have that. is there anyone else is there a similar um uh support network elsewhere like is is the is the blueprint of Sado transferable to other parts of you know like i don't know into sydney yeah. or to brisbane yeah, or yeah. Look, to Mumbai or something it's a really good question in fact it's something that we've been working on because um you know Sado, it's a um it's a program that's essentially been funded philanthropically and through donations so, yeah, um, finding other ways of actually, you know, we've got some great IP there. We've developed it up over the years. We've got a really good, the skill in sourdough is actually finding, you know, a business or someone that comes to us that says, hey, this is what I, this is my issue, finding a mentor for them that actually complements them. And that's the skill that we've really got. We've got a good network of mentors. So how do you actually find that match? We don't have many that don't work. We've had one or two that don't work. Um we've become good at sort of saying, well, over time, you know, you need a different mentor because, you know, that mentor-mentee relationship changes the challenges in the business or whatever it is changes. And we don't just mentor businesses. We mentor lots of things. You know, it can be a it can be a not-for-profit. It can be a whole different, a uh, whole series of things. But generally, you know, smaller businesses is what we mark. And look, our real, you know, one of the real goals there, Charlie, is to actually get, um, you know, good or develop up really good, um, non-government-funded, meaningful jobs. That's the way we sort of target it. And there are two things that are important. So one, we don't want it to be government-funded because we don't want to go through the government cycle of, you know, here one day, gone the next. And secondly, we want the jobs to be meaningful because what we've always realised is that, you know, uh, you know, for quite a while this region has had a really big issue with youth unemployment. You know, and, and it, well, like if you wanted to be unemployed, it's not a bad place to be. You know, it's a pretty beautiful place. But but that has its own challenges as well. But sort of finding enough genuine jobs here, you know, we don't have many big businesses. And I've always been of the view that big businesses are not ever going to be, they're never really going to grow their workforces. You know, they're, they have a capacity to access capital. So if you can actually automate something, they will, right, because it's cheaper. So where do you get employment? When you get employment growth through those businesses that can go from five people to eight people, right, and or from three people to five or whatever. And, you know, those businesses, if you can keep them nice and strong and, and make them strong so that their, you know, family businesses can be sold because that's one of the other things. You get a lot of family businesses that need succession. If you want to keep employment in the community, you've got to make sure that happens. Those businesses are profitable. So that's actually how we really got onto it. And it's well, it's still going, you know, 15 years later. So it's been really successful. That's just got me thinking about the farming. You talk about succession, which is often a problem in farming families and businesses. Um, can be done well, but often done very poorly. Mm. Um, and also the concept of, you know, a farm generally, there's some automation that can happen in farming. But generally if you, you know, farms that grow bigger, you've got more cattle to move or more land to crop, you um, Generally, you need more labour. So, do you? So, to me, that would be 
that that'd be a, like a, a great target market, wouldn't it, for for mentoring of, of farming businesses that generally, if they were to grow, they would they would employ more people, and then that is wonderful because with all the rivers is one thing and is pretty highly populated, really, and there's a lot of support and there's there's very different socioeconomic sort of scale here, um, uh, acknowledging that and and going further west and into the country where, you know, some of those communities are just dying to, well, they're dying, you know, and they're dying to get more people there. So, again, that sort of mentoring program in rural communities would be wonderful if, it, if the, one of the end results is to get more people there. Is there is there um, many farmers going through the program here and can, you know, can can you could you see a lot of farmers benefiting from it if it was, Planted somewhere else, out, out further west. Oh yeah, look, I think it's a it's a really really good question because, you know, labour um, and the capacity to pay labour a competitive rate is is a really important thing. And, and you know, there's plenty of stories about, um, you know, particularly in the vegetable sector in ag, where it's not necessarily a fair rate paid. You know, those sorts of stories, and that's that's simply a, a measure of return, right? And is that changing now because of the labour shortage? Well, I don't, look, I don't know. I'm just not close enough to yeah. that. But it's, I think the thing, the, the point you make is a good one. As you grow, it demands more labour, which demands different skills. You know, you've got to be able to manage people. And that's that's something that some people do. It's, you know, naturally it's something that some people really struggle with. Um, you've got to be able to pay a competitive rate. And, you know, um, I think it is important for regional areas, and when you go out to a lot of our farms and you look and you talk to people in the towns, you know it's a genuine challenge to keep enough people there to keep the school open, to keep all these other things active. So you've got to find ways, and it all comes back to I've got to be profitable, right? And I've got to have enough cash. And so I think it's you know, look, I think mentoring is one of the things, and it goes back to that point about profit, you know, the P and L that I was talking about before. I think. Mentoring is one of the great ways of actually transferring skills, and you know we um, with Highland Beef and you know, sort of involved in this in that webinar series that we've started to run for our farms. The feedback on that has been terrific because it's a really good way to get people together, whether it's over Zoom or whether it's you know um, you know walking through someone's paddock one day and having a bit of a chat. It's all about information transfer and. You know, sometimes it's the simple things. Like you don't, you know, you can be targeting to do something else, but you actually, you know, people just pick up other things in the conversation. And that is that is a really important part of learning because ultimately it all comes back to, well, if I want to actually keep people employed, I've got to be making enough money to actually sustain that. And, and you've got to sustain it over the cycle because, you know, if they're making a decision to a mortgage, then they've got to stay there. You know, you're, you essentially have to deliver that and you can't, you know, you can't be dipping into your capital all the time through mortgages or other things. You, it's got to be coming out of cash flow. Um, what I'm con- what, one of the things I'm excited about being involved with Highland Beef, Murray, is that community which was really evident um, the other night. Yeah. And I think that the potential to grow that opportunity to share more information, um, as I've said on the night, I think you know the the place I learned the most when I was you know formative years of farming and managing our farm at Bora was. In someone else's shearing shed on every quarter, we'd go mm. to someone's house. And then we were conventional farming then and it was a lot of, you know, the, the agronomist was probably there too and there was lots of of that kind of advice flying around, which is fine. But um, I learned a hell of a lot mainly from the farmers who were there. So with the community that you're, you're, you're creating and nurturing with, with your um, your farmers with Holland Beef, um, it's a great opportunity to for them to listen to, you know, Diana Rogers or um, Nicole Masters or any of the sort of, you know, people in the space. And they don't necessarily have to be regenerative farmers doing a talk to, to, to them. It, it just it could be about business. It could be about meditation. It could be about so many wonderful things. So that's the opportunity that is presenting itself with, with the network you're creating, but also that inter, the sharing of it. And it might it might be over Zoom. And maybe we'll get them together in a, you know, well, it won't be probably a wool shed, will it? We'll, no. <laughs> <probably> a, <laughs> no, it should be, be a paddock book. somewhere. <laughs> a paddock somewhere. But um, the point being that that's a great opportunity to get, get them together um, for that learning. And I was even just thinking of just now about the, um, depending on the location of the farmers and sort of hubs of of of, of member farmers, there, you know, if, if these businesses are growing and 
there's, you know, they literally need more labour, but not another labour unit. Or maybe it's only a couple of days a week. You know, maybe there's some, there's already a network of understanding and philosophy around. Well, I'll have this. You know, let's put, let's let's employ someone for a week, yeah, sharing, and I have them for a day. You have them for a day. I have them for two days. You know, or that that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. So I guess that's the the beauty of forming a tribe, really, yeah. isn't it? You know. Well, look, I think I think um, in a communities of whatever they are. I mean, you know. One of the real powers of the internet is is the capacity to actually create those communities, and you know, there's um, it gives you a capacity to get out and communicate in in any number of ways. I think I think it's really important still to get the group together, and you know, because you just get a different sort of communication when you do that. But um, you know, most businesses, you know, particularly smaller businesses, that people are generally time poor, and so finding good ways to increase learning but also increase just general knowledge and that's one of the reasons people like Diana Rogers you know is important how can you sort of mix that learning up so that so that people are really engaged with it you know because um I think that you know that's the other thing that's about it's important about learning it's important about sort of the jobs we create for people you've got to make them meaningful you've got to make them interesting I think that's also one of the Wonderful things about, you know, call it regenerative farming or natural farming or however you want to frame it up is that it is interesting. You know, we're, we're, mm. it, it, it relies on farmers more to be resourceful, I, I would suggest, because they're not necessarily relying on the bloke down the, the road with a bag or something to go and he just buys and puts out or, you know, helps grow his grass or whatever. It sort of it stops that abdication of responsibility and advice and, you know, it does – and there's there's a number of surveys that you know kicking around. Um, we were involved in one a couple of years ago, which identified that farmers doing things more naturally, to say, or in a regenerative manner, thirty thirty three percent more more likely to be to be happy and and and, and had a, had a higher state of wellness. Yeah, you know, and I think it's to do. It, I think there's lots of layers to that, but one I think is definitely that sense of autonomy. Mm-hmm. You're not relying on every other. You know, you haven't got every agent and someone's trying to sell you stuff and you're not relying on them and you're not so much um, uh, beholden to, you know, market forces of, of, of inputs as well, you know, and you, often you're making some of your own stuff or you're – and there's just a – I don't know, I find that the, the cohort of farmers who are looking at things differently, a particular type of person, you know, they're, they're, they're curious, they're generally pretty courageous too because they're often, you know, they're the weirdos. Who've got thistles in the front paddock? Yeah, you know where yeah, yeah. where they used to have it as clean as anything, and there's no bloody grass and they're loose, and, and you know it often takes um, you know a little bit of courage to sort of step out of the norm. The you know they're, they're certainly in my situation, um, their old or, or current um, farming paradigms, and I say not not paradigm in a bad way. It's just a way of thinking. It's just yeah. a belief system. You know, it's, no one has to change. And this is not about changing anyone's beliefs. It's just. Um, I think it's really encouraging that, that your co- cohort of farmers are looking at those things and they tend to be curious, courageous, kind of, um, you know, inquisitive people, clearly, yeah. and doing good jobs too. Well, it, yeah, that. it's it, it's interesting, isn't it? And actually, you know, when you talk, I think there's, um, it's interesting, I think when you start learning and when people sort of start stepping into this space, um it might be hard to start, but once they get in there and once they see some benefit, they they genuinely become really intrigued by it. I think it's actually it's almost like a journey. They once they put that that foot in, away they go, and then there's the next thing. And so there's, and you know, you're right. It's not all straightforward either. I mean, there's plenty of people that have talked about how difficult that change is, um, but they all seem to go through it. And they survive. Yeah, generally. Yeah. Um, talking about surviving, I'm just making sure you're going to survive the next. We're just going to go to a quick little Q and A for our Patreon members, and if you're not a Patreon member and you want to hear um, some more gold from Murray, you'll just have to sign up to Patreon. Um, go to charliearnett.com.au and jump on there for your monthly membership. Um, you'll get Q and As. You'll get um, transcripts of the of the. Um, uh, of each of the episodes, the, our guest in, interviews, you get a weekly um, video from me and you'll have a monthly webinar with our guests. So you might just cop yourself a, a spot on one of our webinars one day too, Murray. Um, 
if anyone wants to know more about Holland beef, what's what's their in terms of their um, thinking? Only farmers who have grass, and they'd like to sort of secure a position with you guys um, for all the reasons we we've probably already highlighted. How do they sort of how are they best to proceed? Well, um, you can simply go to the website. Um, you can leave your details there. There's a phone number there if you want to give us a call. Um, generally, people have some you know questions. Um, we can organise a time to come out and sit down and have a chat with you. I think that's the place to start. Mm. Murray, it's been wonderful sitting here. The sun's getting a bit lower to the west. Um, I'm conscious that you probably will be in bed in half an hour. Um, when when did you sleep last? Did you get a bit of a snooze on the plane back over? Yeah, I did. No, I was pretty fortunate. I've I've got hundreds of thousands of frequent flyer points, and they offered me an upgrade at the gate. And I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you can you can stretch the legs out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was good. It was nice. Beautiful. I would. Ne- I've, I'm a bit of a cheap traveller, so I don't pay for those things. But I was happy to cash <laughs> some points in if they were going to give it to you. Yeah, um, Murray, we will we'll do a bit Q and A, and then I'll let you get to get to. Sounds good. Go for, go for us news. That's been fa- fantastic, Murray. Really appreciate that. Thanks, Charlie. And next week on The Regenerative Journey, I interview Brock Hatton, co-founder of a business called Chief, and they produce protein bars, biltong, collagen, collagen bars, amongst other things, uh, not just producing a delicious snack, um, but also telling the stories of the farmers they, they source their food from and advocate for regenerative practices and following your food systems and understanding the importance of doing so. Um, tune in next week to listen to Brock and I have a yarn, find out why Brock went from a design engineering career into uh, food production and uh, regenerative agriculture advocacy. Next week on The Regenerative Journey. This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.